read me romance read read me romance read me romance read read me romance you could take a look in a book that's fine or you could sit back relax and unwind and read me romance read read me romance welcome back lady listeners Hey, lady listeners, you are here for the second installment of Capturing His Kitten by Mink. So thanks for joining us. We'll play the second half in just a few minutes. We're going to catch up first. Um, I I wanted to mention um, last week um, we talked about TV shows and stuff, and I have on here um, The Great British Baking Show. And I don't know if you've ever watched it or if that interests you at all. Normally, I don't like food shows. It makes me hungry. Yeah, they make me incredibly hungry. But the reason I like this one is because there's no money. There's no real prize. It's just you get to say you won. Mm -hmm. And because of that, there is so much camaraderie on this show. And it's so sweet because it's like at one point, you know, somebody was like, I need help. I need hands. And like everybody came over and like helped her move this thing to a platform. So like her cake wouldn't fall. And then like, you know, another thing happened with this guy like messed up and like other people came over. Oh, here, use this. I'm not using this anymore. Oh, here, take this. You can use mine, you know? And it's like, it's so unusual to see a competition show, technically a competition show, where people genuinely don't want people to be eliminated. I like that. I it is like so pure and wholesome. I'm not like, super competitive when I play like board games or like other mm-hmm. people. That's why I don't like to play a lot of times. Cause I'm like, okay, I was playing the board game to have fun and everybody yeah, is yeah. too serious for me. Mm-hmm. So I don't want to play, but that sounds adorable. I don't know. See, I'm still pretty competitive. I would probably still want to win just to say that I won. But I feel like once you're among the people that are there and they all are kind of rooting for you and trying to help you. Like in last season, there was this older guy who was really, really knowledgeable, but he had a bad week and they do three, they make three different bakes. And he just, for whatever reason, he had a bad week and his three bakes weren't the best. And mm-hmm. so he was eliminated. But they were still quarantined because it was during COVID when they were filming or the year after COVID. Mm-hmm. So they all had to stay the entire time of filming. So he was still there. And so one of the contestants said that at the end, they were like, you know, I owe it all to this person because he he would helped me every week. He would answer questions. He would give us all advice. He was like the best and most knowledgeable of all of us. And that's why we were all successful was because of him. And I was just like, how lovely, you know? And yeah. one girl, she came and it was when they were kind of being quarantined. And she said, I thought I was going home week one. She said, I 100% thought I was not going to make it on the show. She said, I only brought one change of clothes. And she said, so as the competition went on and she got down to the finals, she said, people were literally giving me their clothes. So you can see her in episodes. She's wearing other people's shirts and stuff like in the episodes. It's so funny. But it was cute. I know that she said people were just giving me their clothes. That's the way to do it, though. Only take one pair of underwear and watch. You're going to get stuck. Yep. Watch. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. It's when you when you don't plan for it is when it happens. Right. Oh. I know. I always said, like, if I went on Survivor, I'd just shave my head so I wouldn't have to worry about it. And they're like, no, no, no. That means you're in it for the long haul. You don't want people thinking that when you go in. Mm. You don't want to get cocky. But, you know, like, shows like Survivor, there's so much backstabbing and manipulation and alliances. And, like, it's – I don't enjoy that when I watch TV. I mean, you know, it's a little drama. is fun every now and then. But that can't be the the whole show. I yeah. would die. I because I believe I've been watching crime shows and I'm like, no, it wasn't him. Listen, he's fine. <laughs> See, you hear what they said. Yeah. See, it's a misunderstanding. Mm-hmm. They're like, no, we got it on video. And then they show no, like, God he, damn he murdered it. everybody. <laughs> but that's just like this show is just it's so pure of heart. And so when I watch it, yes, I usually try to bake something or I try to have dinner planned when I when I'm gonna watch an episode or whatever. Because it does make me want to try new things and be like, oh, that looks really good. Some of them, like, that's weird as fuck. I've never ate it. But genuinely, when I watch it, it is the most uplifting show because it just, it restores faith in humanity almost. When I see people like this in this sort of setting, this competition setting, that are just, they're rooting for each other. And that never happens unless you're on America's Next Top Model via like 1997. Where, oh, did they cheer like, for each other? where she was like, we were rooting for you. We were all rooting for you. 
Do you not remember that episode? That like meme where Tyra Banks is screaming. I've never watched that show. We were rooting for you. Oh my god, it was. uh, That's a good one. That's a classic. A and T M. I used to love the fuck out of that show till it got dramatic and competitive and backstabby, and I was like, I'm out. That's probably how I'll be with Love Is Blind. If it ever changes to that sort of manipulation, like The Bachelor or whatever, I'm just like, no, I'm out. You know, because these women aren't really competing for against each other because the way they have Love is Blonde set up, they have all the women in one room and all the men in the other. And so they all get to be friends. Mm -hmm. What happens is, is when one of the women likes a man she didn't end up with, like they had a connection in the pods, but they didn't choose each other. So it's like, or this guy had a connection with two women, but he only picked one. Like sometimes there's drama with that and that can come back to bite them in the ass where it's like, oh, I kind of had like these really intimate conversations with this person that I didn't end up with. And so like that sort of a dramatic episode, like aspect of the show, but it really can't be helped when you're dating 15 people at one time, you know? Yeah, because so, some things just tumble out in conversation exactly. goes a certain way. Yeah, and sometimes you feel like you can open up to people, and you do, and then you find out, like, okay, maybe this wasn't the vibe, you know? So there's, like, one situation where this guy is, like, really talking about, like, things that really bothered him as a kid and, you know, things that really hurt him emotionally. And she's in the other room, like, doing jumping jacks and stretching, and he's, like, are you working out? Like he can hear her moving around. And she was like, Oh yeah, you can hear that. And he's like, yeah, I can. And he's like, nah. And so like, you know, it was that kind of thing where he was sort of pouring his heart out and she was kind of a bitch about it. <laughs> but I mean, you know, shit like that happens. It, it I happens feel like that could definitely world. be me or not be me at all. Yep. It's either one. I could, that would definitely be me doing jumping jacks or not. Um, yeah. One or the well, other. Well, she wasn't invested in this person. You know, she was just kind of like, oh, this is fun, whatever. And he was getting really deep and emotional. And she was like, oh, that's not what I was doing. I was just here for a good time. When there's this other guy she's talking to that she really has that emotional connection with. I bet he was happy she was doing jumping jacks. I know, right? <laughs> From that side, it's sweet. Yeah, From the other side, it's me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I know. It's sweet to see the two of them together now. I, there are a couple that I could go 50-50 on if they're going to actually go through with a wedding or not. Because the only thing that makes me think that she won't go through with it is that he is about to start a PhD program, I think. So he's going to be a student again. And he's like, I'm, he's like, I got a full ride. So, But he was like, it's student housing. I can't work while I do it. Like my full-time job is being a student. And he was like, I'm, I have money saved up, but I don't want to blow that savings in our nest egg for the future just because you have a fancy lifestyle and want to keep that while I'm in school. And so he's going to school in California. She lives in Texas. That's where they met was in Texas. And she's like, well, I don't want to give up my apartment in Texas, but I feel like if we're married, you should contribute and pay for my apartment. And I kind of see what she's saying, but I also feel like, mm, does if he? You guys have are going to get married. If you guys are going to get married, yeah. This is an investment in your future. Him going to school. That's what he business. says to her. Like this, this is, is an yeah. investment. Mm-hmm. He was you like, know, sometimes if, I'm going to do better than you are, and you're going to mm-hmm. do better than I am. Yeah, That's he a said things might be lean for a couple of years, but our future together is what I'm working towards, and I think. That's what makes me think she might say yes. I don't know how shallow she is. You know, she may just be like, I want my lifestyle. I'm not willing to sacrifice. Or she might really be genuine about this guy and say, you know what? This is forever. Like what's two years and forever? Yeah. I don't know if that's going to happen. So that's why I'm excited to see what happens with the wedding. I'm I'm excited to see who goes through with what. Mm. Yeah, I'd love that show. I'm sorry. I could talk about it forever. But I have an email I want to read. So I told you the other day that we had a lady listener send an email. And I had to email her back and make sure that I had permission to read it. Because it was really personal, but it was also really beautiful. I haven't heard (laughs) it. No, you haven't. (laughs) Hey, ladies. So this is going to be out of the blue. And most likely not the content y'all are used to getting for the podcast. But I'm going to tell you guys how the Alexa Riley signing at Editions Bookstore last November, almost a full year ago, kept my family together and kept me sane. Mm -hmm. That's how it starts. Um, I'm also going to use this email to express my gratitude towards you two because words will never explain when I need them to. We'll get to that later. 
as you probably assume from the email, um, and I'm not going to say her name just in case she, I'll just call her R. So I'm R, <clears throat> and I've been a lady listener for years. I vividly remember having three babies in a car seat on my way to and from daycare with the podcast on to keep me sane. No, they're not my biological kids, but they could be. I've spent the past five years raising my niece five, my nephews four, because they deserve the best life. They, they deserve the best in life. And my husband and I knew my sister couldn't do it alone. Back last year to this day on the dot, I decided I was going to travel from Ohio to the Alexa Riley signing. She, I remembered her when I saw her name, I remembered her, but I remember she drove from Ohio and it was like 10 hours or something crazy. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> my sister finally got her life straightened out. And for the first time in years, I was doing something for me. It was the best decision in life. I picked the kids up from daycare on a Thursday, took them to my mom's, picked up my friends and headed out. I know the details seem unimportant, but I promise you they are important. I had the time of my life. I'm horribly awkward in person. Sorry, Leah, but it was the time of my life. That time from Thursday to arriving back home Sunday was the best. I came home to my sister having COVID and the kids being quarantined with her. It sucked, but it gave me time to read my new books. It was on that Friday when everything changed. One of my nephews was playing and he fell. He had a seizure and was live flighted to the nearest children's hospital. My mom called me on Friday the 12th to inform me that he was, he was in a bad way and to come to the hospital. He had a brain bleed from an undiagnosed condition and he went to emergency brain surgery. I went to the hospital with a few trusty books from y'all, not knowing the severity of the surgery. I don't think I read a single page that made sense from the book, The Princesses, but it kept me occupied when he was sleeping. I stayed there for 13 days with your books and the podcast in my ears to keep me company. It was the noise that wasn't machines beeping that kept me sane. Nobody else was allowed from my family to be there, partly because of COVID restrictions, but partly because they thought it was abuse. This is where y'all really came in. My nephew had a soft spot on his head, an unknown soft spot, and if it even bumped, it would have caused the brain bleed. We didn't know this. On Friday the 5th, the day before the signing, he had a fall at daycare and it caused a slow bleed. When he fell again the next week, it's what caused the seizure in the surgery. It took the doctors 126 days to figure this out and prove that it wasn't abuse. During that time, the system wanted to take the kids. Anyone who had been with the kids from the 5th to the 12th, not in a public place, was mar marked as suspect and wasn't allowed to care for the kids. I left on the 4th. I had photo evidence of me and Leah together on the 6th. That trip, the photo evidence, evident, the receipt from the bookstores is what kept the state from taking away my babies. I remember sitting with my mom and crying because we thought that it wasn't enough proof when we thought they'd take the kids right before Thanksgiving. But we got extremely lucky and it wasn't as easy, an easy next four months or even now it isn't exactly easy. But that signing was that wild card that kept the kids with us until we could all get cleared and find out a medical diagnosis. And words will never explain how grateful I am for that signing. I told my husband before this most recent signing that I was a little scared to go back to Kannapolis because she came back again this year. I was scared things would go to hell again, but I went because if there was a way I could support y'all, I will. It'll never be enough. And I haven't picked up that copy of The Princesses since the day in the hospital, but it sits on a plate as a main display on my bookshelf and it's earned that place. I know it's not what y'all expected to read when you open this up. I'm so sorry. I just had to get it off my chest and say thank you. R. I attached photos of Leah and us and of my babies and she put them on the bottom. Oh, Is that God. not the absolute sweetest? Like it was just, it I, it was so beautiful. And I just thought, wow, how crazy that all of that happened. And she was able to prove this. Yeah. Because she was there with that, you know, like she was there at the signing. It was insane. It's insane. Oh. I always think of stories like that ripple effects. Yes. And what's crazy to me is that this really hit home with me when I read it because one of my best friends, her daughter was born and she had a genetic abnormality that nobody knew about until one day my friend looked over and her daughter was having a seizure. She was a little baby. Mm -hmm. They rushed her to the hospital. And the hospital immediately assumed that it was abuse, that the mom had shaken the baby. Yeah. And the whole time, 
the hospital is arguing with the mom about abuse. Her daughter is dying. Like her, th this brain bleed continues to bleed. Like that's what blew my mind was, and I understand that there are situations where there is abuse and these horrible things happen. And that's why people assume it because it does happen. But it was just, I mean, they got so lucky that their daughter was able to get this surgery in time because she almost died, you know, arguing about if someone hurt her, you know, and it took them a while to figure out that, oh, no, this was just genetic. This was something, you know, a fluke thing that happened that nobody knew. But they even took like, you know, they took them away separately from her and like questioned them. They questioned their other child. They pulled their other child out of out of school without the parents permission and interviewed their child separately about the baby so it was like it was just this huge invasion they went to their home you know without their consent and like they had to have another family member meet them there and let these people inspect their home and it was like they couldn't be there like it was it was awful that is awful but i will say from mm -hmm. the other side yeah, I know. On the other side, I felt like the system mm -hmm. failed my nieces and nephews. Yes. Like yes. they weren't, they don't check up. They don't check in. They don't, they didn't do anything. I wonder if it's because it was a situation where these, these children in these two situations, they went to the hospital because of a brain injury, you know, and mm -hmm. that's why everyone was questioned. And, but you know, that's why our story hit me so hard because I knew what my one of my best friends had gone through. You know, I held her and we cried together, you know, while all of this was happening. You know, I kept her other child while they were in the hospital. You know, like this was it was awful. But again, I understand that this does happen. And it's a, it's a awful reality that it happens. And that's why they have to look out for the kids in this. But that's why this story just tore at my heart so much because I know the experience that R went through with this. But I mean, like you say, there are instances of this that you've experienced firsthand where there wasn't this big cataclysmic moment, you know, where your, your nieces were, you know, something like this happened and all of a sudden somebody decided to investigate. No, they just let somebody come in. They're like, we'll take them. And they're like, okay. Oh, God. And I was like, really? Mm -hmm. <laughs> no. And even yeah. like, um, <clears throat> crazy enough, my drug induced sister tried to report me to child services and they came out <laughs> and they didn't even know. My sister made crazy charges. They like walked in and they were there for like two seconds and walked back out. Maybe they yeah. realized it was yeah. stupid, yeah. but they didn't like they even look around the house. Yeah. I'm like, I feel like as mad as I am, I'm like, I feel like you guys are not aggressive enough. About <laughs> like it yeah. irritated me on yeah. behalf of them. I'm like, mm -hmm. I feel like the system isn't. What if we weren't here? Yeah. It irritated me. But that was like 15 years ago. So who knows? Yeah. And, you know, I just, um, I love that she felt she could share this story and that it, it just meant so much to her. But also, you know, to be able to, in some way, you know, when she was in the hospital and we've heard this from so many people before that, like, you know, I listened to your, your podcast in the hospital. I read your books in the hospital, you know, while my loved one was sick and my loved one was going through things. And it's like it to be someone's comfort in that time is truly like, it, it's a gift because I just, I don't know how to, I don't know how to react to something like that because it's so emotional, you know, because I'm glad we're able to give someone comfort in a time that there's nothing anyone can do, you know? Yeah. It's interesting to say that because mm -hmm. when I think back on some of my rough times reading paperbacks mm -hmm. and I can name the paperbacks, mm -hmm. I know which ones they are that I took. Yeah. You know, it's funny too. Someone said to me one time they came to my house and they were like, you know, it's weird for an author. You don't have a lot of books. And I was like, no, I actually don't because I only keep, the really important ones. Yeah. And I, I don't have, have a ton either. Mm -mm, no. 
Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, I got a lot of shit on my Kindle, you know, yeah. also, well, and all my audios. We won't go there. But like, as far as like physical books, I will only have physical books that mean everything to me. Yeah. I mean, that that's just how I roll. I'm not keeping a book because I liked it. I'm keeping a book because I can't live without it. <laughs> you know, like. No, you're and, right. Like, yeah. as I look around my office, I'm like, I literally probably have. 30, 40 books, and I've been to millions of signings. Yeah, millions. Yeah, yeah. And I have a ton of author friends, mm-hmm. and I don't even have theirs. Like a lot of their books. Many, I've got like three little sections that have stacks of books. Mm-hmm. That one's Twilight. That's all my Twilight books that are like broke. The spines are broke. They're dog eared. Mm-hmm. Water's all through one of them. And then there's my Harry Potter books over there. Again, they're the same way, they're just trashed. And in the middle, those are our Alexa Riley, our foreign ones. I have our foreign ones on my mantle downstairs. For, the foreign ones are so pretty, and mm-hmm. those are just so cool. And it's not like you can just go to the store and get one or order one offline. They're, like, hard to get. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so when we got them, I was like, I'm never getting rid of these. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. But, yeah, I mean, I, I get what she's saying, though. Like, you know, in, the, in those moments, it was nice to have that comfort. And I'm so glad that we were able to provide even a little bit of it. So, just thank you so much for sending that email, R. We really appreciate it. So, all right. Oh, I have another one too. Hold on. I saved this one. Hold on. Let me see if I can grab it. Sorry. I had to like hide it when the kids came in here earlier. I was uh, like, I don't want them reading this stuff. I don't even know if it's bad or not. All right. This one says, the girl with the Prada. Thank you for fueling today's hyperfixation. I'm at work listening to episode 185.2, where Leah's cousin's co-worker is slaying the office attire. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, so this is when I was talking about my cousin. She came back from attorney leave, and there was that girl in her office that had all, like, the Prada and the Gucci Mm -hmm. and, like, the evening wear. And she's like, what are you doing? And she wore all of her expensive clothes when she packed all of those with her when she came overseas because she didn't want to leave them in shipping containers for like six months. Yeah. So she wore all her really expensive clothes. Um, this is first thought on the other side of the devil wears Prada. We've all seen the movie and we know that Andy's friends are the true devils in this situation, right? What 20 something friend group turns to their girl for trying to find gainful employment in NYC, a trash group. That's who. <laughs> <laughs> so our Andy character has returned from working in Paris slash Milan or where the fuck fashion week people work with her boss ass wardrobe, but she's now a hoodie chick startup. <laughs> what is this? Her New York bestie is all, you look amazing, but I can tell that your feet are killing you. Do you want to borrow some flats or book one? Here one is all, oh my God, yes, you are my sunshine and proceeds to tell her that her former roommate slash boyfriend slash trash friend you own, pick your own devil, lock her out of her apartment with her regular clothes. So all she has is her fashion rel- relics, which she loved, but are ridiculously uncomfortable. Her new bestie offers her a room at her adorable rent controlled apartment and access to her comfy clothes. And they live happily ever after. <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah. Somewhere along the line, our book one heroine finds some dude and to love. And the bestie roomie is our book two heroine that it's just that's but that's beside the point. Sisters before misters, Carrie. <laughs> I love this. She like heard this episode and went down a whole rabbit hole. Yeah. Like, I think it should go like this. I love yeah. it. I love it. That's incredible. <laughs> Somebody write that book for me. I um, love a good know, heroine. That's what we're enjoying a heroine and one of oh the first God. heroine in the troping series. Like, she is, she the is like best. Popping into all okay, the other books. So this book that we've got that's releasing soon is called Brother's Best Enemy. And it's enemies to lovers, brother's best friend. So it's her brother's best friend. And they're like, they hate each other. But she is ridiculous. She's probably one of She's my favorite sheriff. heroines She's in a long time. She's the of this Hallmark town where there's no crime. And she like makes up crimes to give him a ticket. Like she'll, she gets him for jaywalking, for making an illegal U-turn, for parking in a handicap. But his tires literally, he's in a regular spot. His tires literally touching the paint for the handicap. And she just gives him a ticket because she just hates him. <laughs> and so, but what's funny is, it's like their love story is adorable. And it was a lot of fun to write. And she was such a fun hero. Heroine that we really couldn't let her go 
So now we're writing, we wrote and we wrote book to, or a book for the podcast we wrote and she's all in that one where she's up in this pregnant girl's business. Like who's this baby daddy, you know, and like showing up at her place, like what's going on here? You know, she's just in everybody's business. And now we're in book three for it. And it's the same thing where it's the, it's her brother's book. He's the, he's the mayor. He's the, yeah. He's the mayor of the town. His name's North. And he's falling for a secretary and she's just coming through, like busting in, like, what's going on here? You know, and I just, I love her so much because like if anybody's so committing crime in the town, it's, it's her. her. <laughs> it's her. So I wrote this epilogue yesterday and it was so funny when I wrote it and I was like, I'm writing this and it's funny. So I know it's pretty good, but it's so cute because in the epilogue, this is the, this is the book that's coming out. It's called the cozy agreement. And so it'll be the book after, um, brother's best enemy. So it's going to be, uh, forced, yeah, proximity it's forced proximity and arranged, and marriage, arranged right. marriage. Oh, and also boss secretary. Yeah. So, um, so the cozy agreement. So it's her brother that's in the book. So in the epilogue, the hero of the story, the brother, he's he's doing an auction, but it's like a a bachelor auction only. It's for you know he's married at the end of it. Spoiler: they get married, they live happily oh ever God. after. Do they have babies too? It, yes, they have babies. <laughs> So anyways, at the end of it, though, it's an auction, but it's for a retirement home. So you're offering basically just companionship to like offer to help them out if they need it, just to sit and talk to them once a week. You're just sort of offering like to be there for them. And they do this at Christmas. They call themselves like the elves or whatever. They auction off elves. And it's like a penny auction. So the older people just spend pennies. And so he gets up to do it. And his sister's like, what's going on here? What is all this? You want these hussies like bidding on you? And he's like, they're hussies? What? And she, and then she realizes her husband is getting up to do it too. And she was like, what is this? And so she gets on the stage and demands to be auctioned off too. And then she's like, hey, y'all, I'm the sheriff. I can help you get away with crumbs or cover one up. And then her brother's like, Tinsel. And he's like yelling at her. And she's like, what? So... It ends up being really cute that she's up there and like, and then she says, you know, it's a package deal. If you buy me, you get my husband too. <laughs> you know, like she's not letting him get in the auction off by himself. She's like, we're a set and this is going together. <laughs> but it's like, she's so ridiculous that we couldn't let her go. So I'm sure she'll be in all the books now because sure. I just love her so much. The yeah. next one we're writing is about the baker. Her name's Frosty. And I I already, she's already all up in it in the first chapter. Of course she Frosty's is. Frosty's her best friend. Yeah, they used to be roommates. Yeah, so. they're be mm -hmm. childhood best friends. So, so this yeah. series is just adorable. We've had the most fun, right? It really is like Hallmark-ish. You know, like these are just perfect Hallmark movies. You know what's funny? I meant to tell you this. That's what I actually think I say in the first trope. Like she's talking to her. Tinsel. And she's like, yeah. like a fucking Hallmark movie. I can't even talk to you right now. Yep. <laughs> um, so when I was in Mexico, a friend of mine, Rachel, she is an Emmy award winning TV writer. Like that she's she's actually won Emmys. And so she said something. She was like, Oh, I kind of want to just write like a Hallmark movie. I'm thinking about doing that, like writing a script. And she said, If you ever want to turn one of your books into a Hallmark movie, let me know. I was like, bitch, which one do you want? <laughs> I was like, I have a catalog of 200. Go down and take your pick. I really am. I told her, I was like, you know what? I'm going to send you a couple of our Christmas books. You can read them, do with them what you will. Have them. <laughs> I was like, go for it. And she was like, I love it. I think it'd be a great idea. She's so Southern. It's cute. But anywho, um, let's talk about Mink before we get to run too late. I'm so sorry. I know you got stuff to do. But um, so, hold on, make sure I've got all this stuff straight on here. Okay, so you're going to listen to the second half of Capturing His Kitten, which is also connected to Vetting His Kitchen. It's Kitchen. Kitchen. kitten. Oh, my God. Vetting His Kitten. So it's connected to that. So if you like Capturing His Kitten, you're enjoying it, make sure you go grab Vetting His Kitten. Um, the newest release that Mink has out is Unexpected Love, which is a Beauty and the Beast retelling. And Cuffed Love is free right now. All of this will be down in the show notes, so make sure you check that out. And then make sure you enter this week's giveaway, which is a signed paperback and a $25 gift card. So enter away. Right. But I think that's it. Send them in. Let's do it. See you guys on the other side. Bye. Chapter 5. Mariana. 
I drop my head forward to stare down at Fenton. My heart is screaming at me to throw myself into his arms and let him catch me. But I know better. He may want me. He could even really love me one day. But the bottom line is, he wants my family's territory. It would work perfectly for Grant and him. The two of them aren't related by blood, but they might as well be. They'd die for each other. I wonder what it would be like to have that kind of loyalty. Is it messed up that I crave that? Not that I want someone to die for me, but it would be nice to know someone would be willing to do it, to save me. Okay. I'm not sure why the lie rolls off my lips easily. Could be because I wish I could really marry Fenton, or because I'm my father's daughter. He leans forward and presses a kiss to my stomach. Butterflies erupt inside of me at the feel of his lips on my skin. My mind drifts to thoughts of me being pregnant with his child. I wonder if he's thinking the same. He rises from his knees to kiss me next. You won't regret this, he vows to me. His hand slips down between my thighs to cup my sex. You're mine, all of you. No one will ever know you this way. And you? I find myself asking. It's pointless. I know I'm not staying. I'm not going to marry him. I'm not a virgin, Sole. Haven't been for a long time. I... I reach up and put my hand over his mouth. Don't make a joke. I shake my head. Just forget it. I drop my hand and try to pull away to get out of the shower, but he doesn't let me. The rules are different for men in our world. Before I know what I'm doing, I bring my hand back to his face. This time it's to smack him. He catches my hand by the wrist before I can land the blow. If anyone knows the rules are different, it's me. Don't, I hiss. If you haven't noticed, Grant and I don't follow those rules. It's been a long time since I've been with a woman, so it's why you knocked me so hard on my ass. Sure, I've seen beautiful women, but I haven't wanted one haven't really craved anything in a long fucking time. His hand around my wrist tightens. The rush of need I felt when I saw you was unlike anything I've ever felt before. You're different. My heart pounds so loud I'm surprised he can't hear it. I felt that rush of need that day too. I understand what he means. My father is always surrounded by powerful men, and a lot of them are handsome. Yet never had any of them appealed to me. Until Fenton. Good. I reach down and wrap my hand around his cock. He groans when I start to stroke him. I'm finding I'm rather jealous when it comes to you. If I find out that you have a kept woman, I've never kept a woman solely, ever. But you want to keep me? I want to do more than keep you. I'm going to own you. He yanks me to him, claiming my mouth. I've never wanted to be owned by anyone, but Fenton makes it so damn tempting. I kiss him back, knowing this might be our last time together. That thought of becoming pregnant again creeps back into my mind. I'd have to come back to him then. I couldn't run. I'd never keep him from a child that was his just because I didn't think he could love me the way I dreamt of being loved. Fenton lifts me off my feet, pinning me to the shower wall. I wrap my legs around him as he presses his cock against me. He begins sliding it up and down the seam of my sex, 
jacking himself off. Fenton, please, I start to beg. I stare into his eyes, watching his control start to falter. A thrill runs through my body as I realize I'm the only one that can do that to him. I need him one more time. I swear I'm not that sore. Maybe you can push it inside of me a little to see? I slip my hand down between us. You think I don't know what you're doing, he says, but he doesn't stop me as I wrap my hand around his cock and place it against my entrance. The head of his cock slips inside of me. Fenton's fingers grip me tighter. What? I drop my hips back down, taking another inch of him into me. There is a small burn, but nothing compared to the ache to be filled by him. I'm only trying to make you feel good. Sole, he warns. I love when he calls me that. Please, I huff. His cock jerks inside of me. He's getting off on me pouting. Put your smell back on me. He thrusts all the way inside of me. I gasp, my nails digging into him. I'm going to spank your ass again for that. Yes, I moan. I want it all. Then that's what you'll have, he says as he starts to move in and out of me. All that control of his shattering away as he gives me what I asked for. My moans fill the shower as he puts his mark on me once again. When he finally pulls me out of the shower and back into the bed, he gives me that spanking. Fenton doesn't stop until I beg him to. And I only beg because I'm not sure my body could handle another orgasm. Even when I do find sleep, he's there in my dreams, claiming me again. Fenton wasn't joking when he said he wanted to own me. I think he already does. When I come to, no light comes from the windows. The lamp on the nightstand is on with a note from Fenton, saying he'll be back shortly, that he had to check on things. I know that doesn't leave me much time. I have to get out of here. It's now or never. Chapter 6 Fenton A wedding tomorrow? Grant cocks his head at me. As early as possible. I can't stop smiling. I look like a dope, but I couldn't give a shit. I'm in love. She's agreed to marry you? Amelia sits on Grant's lap as he strokes her back. Seriously? Of course. How did this play out? She sounds suspicious. We were in the shower, and we were... Well, you know I was... Skip that part. Grant glowers. Well, I asked her to marry me, and she said okay. Amelia frowns. Just okay? That's the same as yes. I look to Grant for confirmation. He shrugs. I mean... It's not a no. Exactly. I clap my hands hard. This is it. She's the one. Something tickles my ankle, and I look down to find a kitten climbing my leg. That's Granger. Isn't he cute? Amelia motions for me to pick him up. I do and hold him in front of me, staring into his eyes. I'm not great with pets. You don't have to be. Amelia gets up and comes over to me. And it doesn't matter now, anyway. You've been chosen. Chosen? She scratches the little orange cat's head. Yep, cats choose their humans. And Granger just chose you. A wife and a kitten in the space of a few hours. Grant shakes his head from his spot in bed. Seems familiar. We took a little longer. She returns to him and kisses his cheek. Not by much, though. Ranger reaches for my shoulder, and I let him climb up. 
He perches there like a fluffy orange gargoyle. We need to focus. Wedding stuff. Amelia, can you talk to her about dresses or something like that? I need a priest. And what else? I turn back to Grant. You. You'll be my best man. He smiles. I never thought I'd see the day, but here we are. I'm just as surprised as you are. We also need to deal with Fick, but I suppose that's more of your call now. You're taking his territory and marrying his daughter. So unless Amelia objects, I'm letting you decide his fate. She shivers. I don't like the man at all, but I think Grant's right. You and Mariana should decide. Together. That's going to be a sticky conversation. I scrub a hand down my face. Her father tried to hurt Grant and Amelia, and he sold his own daughter into marriage like a piece of cattle. I want him dead, but I can't make that call alone. Amelia's right. I need to discuss it with Mariana. You two will figure it out. Grant shifts in bed. Stop fidgeting. You just survived a bullet wound, Amelia scolds. Get your fine ass back in bed with me. I'll feel all better then. He pats the mattress, then turns back to me. Once Vic is handled, then we move forward. Two kings, two queens. Fuck, I like the sound of that. I know Grant's not my brother by blood, but in this moment, he's my brother in all the ways that matter. Amelia bounces on her feet. I knew. The second I saw the two of you together, I just knew. Is that so? Grant reaches for her and she finally relents and gets back into bed. Did you know the second you saw me? She giggles. You were a bit more difficult to figure out. He kisses her neck. I don't need to see this. Not when I have Mariana waiting for me back in our room. God, the things I'm going to do to that woman. Where are you headed? Grant calls. Downstairs. Yell if you need me, he calls. He doesn't follow me. I don't blame him. He needs rest. Not that I think he's getting any with Amelia in his bed. But hey, now I know what it feels like to be with the woman you love. Leaving her is the hardest thing to do. I descend the creaky staircase and take a sharp left. The basement is relatively neat. Rows of various household items are stacked on shelving. A little light filters in through the high, short windows until I move deeper under the house. Back here, it's dark enough to do dirty work, and deep enough that no one will ever hear the screams. Flipping on the light, I find Vic Elderone tied to a metal chair just where I left him. Still breathing? I smirk as I lean against the wall across from him. He sputters awake and stares at me. Ghostly pale, he's in bad shape. The stab wound I put in his chest is wrapped up, thanks to Grant's personal doctor, but it will likely prove fatal. One of his lungs is collapsed, the other barely hanging on. I should have stabbed a little farther to the left. I shrug. Miscalculation on my part. Release me. He struggles to get the words out. Not happening. I glare at him. I would kill you right now but I can't. Not until I talk to Mariana. He lifts his head at that. That traitorous whore is here? I'm on him before he can take another breath, my hands at his throat. Don't you ever speak about her like that. He laughs, the sound rusty and wet. You take orders from her now? I sure do. Right after I get done making her come, I do whatever she tells me. His eyes widen. You bastard. And good news, I'm going to marry her. I squeeze until he chokes on his own spit. So I guess I'll start calling you Pop, eh? I squeeze a little harder before releasing him and backing away. He sputters, blood dripping from the corner of his mouth. She's mine. Not anymore, Pop. I grin. I should have killed you. Smartest thing you've said. I nod and stride away. Have a good time down here. 
I just wanted to make sure you weren't already dead before I brought Mariana down here. If I were you, I'd start working on my apology. That is, if you want to live. I hit the light and take the stairs two at a time. I move even faster when I think about Mariana waiting for me in our bed. Miss me? I ask as I open the door. I know right away something's off. The room feels cold, empty. No Mariana. Fuck. She's gone. I shake my head. Oh, my sola. I told you I'd chase you if you ran. I grin as I rush downstairs. A spanking I'm about to give her sweet ass is going to be epic. Chapter 7 Mariana I listen for the door to close behind Fenton before I release the breath I was holding. I'd panicked a bit when I heard someone come down the stairs into the basement. I grabbed the first door handle I could find and slipped into the small utility room, closing the door behind me. I'm well aware that if someone catches me, I won't be able to accomplish what I set out to do. And I can't have that. I refuse to allow my father to have any more control over my life. I'm not sure what to think of Fenton's words to my father. Most times I can't tell if he's joking or being serious. Was he teasing when he said he'd do anything I asked of him? Grant and Amelia are that way. It's sweet. He loves her for her. Not because it would work out good for them both. In fact, he almost had to go to war to keep her. They're together because of the strong love they have for one another. I shake those thoughts off. I can't compare what Fenton and I have between us to Amelia and Grant's relationship. None of it matters anyway, because I'll be gone after I take care of my father. I slowly push the door open and step out. I flip the light back on, revealing my father. His head lifts, his eyes blinking, trying to adjust to the light. For once, he doesn't seem scary to me. Maybe it's because I know he can't put his hands on me right now. They're chained to the chair. He's helpless. I have to admit that it's nice that he has to experience it. There's nothing worse than the feeling of being helpless. I should know. I've had it for most of my life. Mariana, he blinks. Is that you, baby girl? My stomach cramps. I haven't been his baby girl in a long time. Not that it means much. When I was little, I would go from being his little girl to a brat within seconds. And apparently now, in his opinion, I'm a whore. It's me. I come to stand in front of him. His face is pale. It's not only the blood loss, but the drugs are starting to catch up to him. He's old. He's not so scary without any of his men by his side. If anything, he's pathetic looking, worn down and old. Don't stand there, get these off me. He pulls at the chains. I watch him struggle. He stops when he realizes I'm not moving to help him. He opens his mouth but quickly closes it to rethink whatever insult he was about to hurl at me. We have to get out of here, sweetheart. I understand why you helped them. You had to. You- I didn't have to do anything. It's the truth. They didn't even ask me to do it. I gave Grant and Fenton a way into my father's stronghold so they could save Amelia when my father kidnapped her. Why wouldn't I? Amelia and Grant have been good to me. In fact, I rushed to help them. How do you think they got in so easily? You're a fucking whore traitor just like your mother, he yells. Think you're so much better than all of us? He starts to ramble on as he always does when he brings my mom up. I barely remember her, but my memories are all good. 
she wouldn't have left me behind. That meant only one thing. He took her from me. His anger grows more when I give him no reaction. You let him touch you, didn't you? You let Fenton fuck you. I fucked him right back. Then I begged him to fuck me again. Damn, that feels good to say. I chose Fenton. It was my choice, no one else's. He starts going off, throwing anything at me to get a reaction. He's using you. You know that, right? A triumphant smile forms on his face when he finds the weak spot he's looking for. You thought he really wanted you. Fenton has always been bloodthirsty, wanting to take over a territory. You'll be nothing more than his trophy whore he'll need to breed himself a few heirs, so he'll feel legitimate. He's a bastard and always will be. I hate how much that stings. Like you? Now it's my turn to taunt. If I understand right from the things I've heard whispered over the years, he'd been a bastard child. His father had knocked up a maid or some crap. Then he went and got my mom somehow. Maybe he'll at least be able to get a son. You never could pull that one off. If he could pale any more, he would. The fight suddenly leaves him at my comment. I'm surprised he doesn't have more children, with all the women that come and go in his life. There has only ever been me. I'm sure that drives him insane. Most of these men won't stop until they get a son. Wasn't for lack of trying, I'm guessing. I lift a teasing brow. I've been hanging out with Fenton too much if I'm cracking jokes at terrible times. Shut the fuck up. I'd made a stab in the dark, but my words had hit his weak spot. If I didn't have the exact same eyes as him, I might doubt that I was even his daughter. But our eyes are unique, in their brown color with a gold ring around the outside. No. I pull the blade out from my back pocket. I snagged it from the kitchen, the first day I'd come to stay here. You wouldn't, he challenges. He's gotten really far in life for being so damn dumb. Thankfully, I only got his eyes. Funny, isn't it? The only child you could have is ultimately going to be your end. Mariana, we're blood, he tries to remind me, finally catching on that I might actually take his life. I've seen Grant and Fenton together. Blood doesn't always mean as much as it should. We are. I clear the space between us. The blade sinks in so much easier than I thought it would. I don't miss my mark. I don't actually believe Fenton did either. My father's eyes go wide as he opens his mouth, but no words come. And I'm freeing myself from you. I pull the knife back out, tossing it onto the floor before I turn to leave. The Alderon name is dead. If Fenton wants it, he can have it. No one's left to stand in his way. Chapter 8 Fenton She hustles up the stairs and peeks around to see if anyone's watching. When she thinks the coast is clear, she dashes down the hallway to the garage and slips through the door. I give Vic's body one last glance, then hit the light at the top of the stairs, putting the whole scene into darkness. I'll clean up later. I've got a woman to catch. My woman. Following her into the garage, I duck beside Grant's classic Trans Am as she seems to be trying to decide between the Ferrari or the Lambo. She's so cute, standing there just considering which expensive-as-fuck performance machine to steal. 
cool and collected, even though she just killed her father. Jesus, I'm hard just thinking about it. He'd called me bloodthirsty, but he clearly underestimated his daughter. She's a force, one I'm going to bend over my knee. Finally deciding, she reaches for the door to the Ferrari. I stand. You know how to drive stick? She jumps and whirls. How did you... I've got your scent, Sole. You sound like an animal. That's exactly what I am when it comes to you. I close the distance between us and grab her by the waist. I saw what you did. Oh. She looks away, then meets my gaze again with a fierceness that makes my blood pound in my veins. I don't regret it. Good. I lift her, and she wraps her legs around my waist. Good girl. She glances at my lips and shakes her head. I'm not falling for this. I've let one man control my life for far too long to just jump into the arms of another one. I'm done with being used for my name. I'm not your father. I grip her ass with one hand and use my other to turn her chin so she's looking dead in my eyes. I'm not trying to use you for anything, Sola. I don't want you for your father's territory. He forfeited that the second he came after Amelia. She nibbles her bottom lip but doesn't respond. I can almost hear her trying to think it through and find some weakness in what I'm saying. But there isn't one. I'm telling her the truth, just like I always will. I don't know if this helps, but... I make a hmm sound. Let me phrase this in a way that won't get me stabbed. Too soon. She leans away from me. I pull her back. Even if you ran away like you planned, far, far away, it wouldn't matter. Your father's holdings belong to Grant and me now, with or without you. That's the way this works. To the victors go the spoils. So I'm a spoil then? She retorts. No. I turn and press her against the Land Rover. I feel like I'm saying this all wrong. What I'm trying to say is that I want you just as you are. No strings to connect you to the Elderones. Besides, you won't have that name for much longer anyway. I lean in, and this time she doesn't move away. You want me. Me. Not an Elderone? That's what I've been trying to tell you. I kiss the tip of her nose. I'm part of this life. Grant and I, it's what we were born for. But you don't have to be involved in any of it if you don't want to be. You can be an interior designer or an astronaut or whatever the fuck you want to be. All I ask is that you stay with me. Marry me. Let me love you. And if you tell me you can't stay, no matter what, I'll go with you. Her eyes water as she stares up at me. You mean it? Every word. I move closer, my lips so close to hers. I didn't know love until I met you. Now I'd do anything to make you happy, Sola. I live for you. She throws her arms around my neck and hugs me tight. I stand there holding her finally able to breathe again. When she sniffles, I pull back and look into her eyes. What's wrong? Everything. Nothing. She laughs a little. I just agreed to marry you. Then I killed my father. And now I'm in love. None of it makes any sense. We make sense. I kiss her hard showing her how much I mean what I've said. I'll always protect her, always fight for her. I keep kissing her as I carry her back into the house and up the stairs. When I get to our room, I put her on the bed and run my hands down her body. I need you, Sole. I need you, too. She pulls at my shirt. I tug it off, then strip her down to nothing and run my hands all along her warm skin. Don't ever take this away from me, Sole. I growl and cover her body with mine. 
Please, Fenton. I need you. She spreads for me, and I slide between her thighs. My cock notched at her entrance. I don't want to hurt you. I kiss her throat. With a thrust, she pushes my head inside her hot, wet cunt. I can't stop myself. I surge all the way inside her, feeling every bit of her as I groan. I give her everything. All of me. Our bodies slap against each other as we work out the terms of our heart's surrender. She moans, her legs spreading even wider as I reach between us and thumb her clit. It's messy and rough and absolutely perfect. Our bodies working as one until we both hit the peak. She arches and comes, her tits jutting into the air. I claim a nipple in my mouth as I shoot inside her, her pussy milking me as I thrust so deep it sends tremors of pleasure up my spine. This is the way we're meant to be. Together. Unraveled and raw. Fuck, I love you. I claim her mouth again. When I come up for air, she pants and smiles. I love you, too. I love the sound of that. When I pull out, she protests. But when I flip her, then put her on her knees, she gives me a questioning look. I rub her round ass. You were going to run from me, Sole. Her eyes widen. You're not going to... Smack. I redden her ass with a much-needed spanking, then kiss the sting away and pull her onto my chest. I can't believe you spanked me, she grumbles. You loved it. She doesn't disagree. Instead, she snuggles closer. Ranger jumps onto the bed and settles on the pillow above my head. Can one of the kittens choose you? She smiles and reaches up to pet him. Yep. I kiss her forehead. Granger. Congratulations. She grins and kisses my cheek. I sigh contentedly. It's the start of my family. And it's messy and new. But that doesn't make it any less real. Or any less perfect. Epilogue. Mariana. Few years later. Everything okay? I ask Junior when he opens the car door for me, offering me his hand. Most times, Fenton is with me wherever I go, but on the rare occasions that he's not, like today, he's usually waiting for me at the front door. Yet today, he's nowhere in sight. I had asked him not to come with me, which I know he wasn't happy about. That man hates when he has to be without me. But honestly, there was no point in him coming. There were a few things I'd asked him to handle for me while I was gone. Amelia had gone to the graduation with me. He's in a mood, Junior informs me. I thought the pregnant one was supposed to be the one to have the mood swings. I reach down and rest my hand on my ever-growing stomach. It had taken almost two years for us to conceive. I'd started to get worried. We both went to specialists to find out what might be the problem, and they assured us nothing was wrong. God and everyone else knew it wasn't for lack of trying. Fenton can't keep his hands off me. Of course, when it finally happened, I didn't only get pregnant with one baby. Nope, it wasn't even twins. Triplets. I mean, really? I'm only three months along and already showing. Fenton strutted around like a peacock for over a month. He was so damn proud of himself. I have to say, after the initial shock, I was more than ecstatic. Honestly, once I found out I was pregnant, I was thankful for the few years we had together with only the two of us. It gave Fenton and me time to enjoy each other. It also allowed me to figure out what I wanted to do with my life. Fenton was nothing but encouraging, 
letting me know that whatever I decided to do, he'd be at my side. The reality was, once I'd come back home with Fenton by my side, I'd realized this is my life. It's in my blood. The problem was I hated how my father did business. It was my chance to step in and make a change, and I had. I'd wanted to level my childhood home. Fenton had no problem with me destroying the $10 million home, which only made me love the man more. But as I settled in more and Fenton showed me all my father's dealings that needed to be handled, I'd come up with a better use for the house. I'd turned it into a halfway house of sorts. It was no surprise my father had a few brothels. I wasn't going to toss any of those women out on the streets. With Amelia by my side, we helped them go back to school and do anything else they might want to do. Two girls actually graduated today, and Amelia and I were front and center to support them. One of the girls is going on to get her veterinary degree. So many women get trapped in those lifestyles and are not sure how to get out. I've found such pleasure and joy in showing them there are options and people out there that want to help. He's in the back office, Junior says with a laugh. Of course he is. Fenton wanted us to share an office, but he is always getting blood all over them. When we built our new home on the other side of the estate, I'd come up with the idea of two offices, with strict instructions that Fenton is to use the back office when he thinks things might get a bit messy. That was another plus of me not conceiving right away. We were able to build our dream home. Parts of it are still under construction, but the major sections are pretty much complete. There is no mistaking the sounds of a fist connecting with someone's face. I already know what I'm going to see when I pull open one of the double doors to the office. Please stop. I swear I thought she was still a whore, the man begs. He earns himself a blow to his kidney for the whore comment this time. You're lucky my wife is home, or we'd have a bit more fun. Don't stop on my account. I smile at my handsome husband, actually hoping he's done. I have missed him dearly, but I also wanted this asshole handled. He obviously needed to be taught a lesson in respecting women. My Fenton was more than happy to teach him for me. Fenton has always been bloodthirsty. I might be too. But it's more when Fenton is the one out for blood. Blood I asked him to collect for me. One thing you don't do is mess with one of my girls. I have to admit, seeing Fenton in action always turns me on. And by the little smirk he's currently wearing, he knows it. Please, the man begs, his eyes shifting to me. Fenton grabs the man around the throat, turning him so he's not facing my way anymore. Are you checking out my wife? No, never, he rushes to say as his face starts to redden. Fenton's hold on his neck slowly begins to tighten. He's toying with the man now. Are you saying she's not worth checking out? The man's eyes go so wide, I'm shocked they don't pop out of his head. I, I, he stutters and tries to turn his head back my way. I bite the inside of my cheek to keep from smiling. Fenton has always been crass and a bit of a jokester, so I'm not in the least surprised by this. Some of that has changed since I've become his. He's not so quick to make dirty jokes about me anymore. He's not fond of the idea of anyone thinking about sex and me together. Even if the joke is about him and me being together, he still thinks they might be picturing me naked or something. That's when his jealousy will come out. And that is never good when you tend to be bloodthirsty. I decide to let Fenton toy with the man a bit more. 
The jerk-off has it coming to him. The asshole had run into one of the girls that used to work at one of my father's clubs and thought he could do whatever he wanted to her, right in the middle of a freaking supermarket that is under our protection. Don't, I give Fenton a stern look when he opens his mouth to say something. I already know what's going to come out of his mouth. He's going to offer to finish the man off for me. It's sweet and all, but it will make the man piss himself, and the only thing worse than blood is piss. I have other, more important things I need you to do with those hands. Junior? Fenton calls out so he can come finish up and eventually take the trash out for him. Fenton gives a hard shove to the man as he lets go of his throat, sending him flying. He lands on the floor a few feet in front of me. It's been over two years. Things have changed in this neighborhood. You clearly haven't gotten the message. I want you out. I'm sending a message of my own. One that lets jerks know I won't tolerate anyone treating women like shit. And if they choose to, they'll suffer the consequences. I'm gone, I swear it. Take him before he pisses himself. Junior grabs the man, pulling him from the office, leaving Fenton and me alone. Have fun without me. Fenton closes the space between us before pulling me into his arms. One of his hands lands on my stomach in a possessive hold. I enjoyed myself, but I know I'm about to enjoy myself a whole lot more. Fenton's other hand sinks into my hair, getting a firm grip on me before he tilts my head back and claims my lips. I moan into his mouth. In front of the rest of the world, Fenton and I always stand side by side. Everyone knows that we are equal when it comes to the amount of power we wield. But when we are alone, in the privacy of our own home, my man is in charge. My body craves it. Fenton takes care of me, and I love every second of it. More than anything, I love that Fenton can give me all these things. He's a rare breed of man, one that doesn't allow his pride to get in the way of his love. What does my wife need? Do you want to suck my cock? I let out a whimper, squeezing my thighs together to try to soothe the throb between them. I'd love for him to shove me to the floor and make me suck him off. But he's not going to. He wants inside me. But first, he wants my taste in his mouth. Fenton. I press myself more into him. My hormones are all over the place. My panties are already soaked through. Fuck your breathtaking soul. I need a taste. He picks me up carrying me over to his desk and setting me on top of it. I swear I'm about to burst with need. Why do you call me Sole? I ask as he steps between my thighs. You're my son. As sappy as it is, you light up my world. For so long I lived in darkness until you stepped into my life. Everything changed in that moment. For the first time, I could see what I wanted in life. My entire world revolves around you. Without you here, there would be no me, only death. Fenton, tears form in my eyes. You're my life. His hand rubs across my stomach. You give me life. I can't believe I ever thought about running from you. I grab his shirt, pulling him down for a kiss. I love this man more than anything. You'll never escape me, my wife. Darkness always finds the light, he says against my mouth, before he claims me yet again.
The End. Want Amelia and Grant's story? Check out Vetting His Kitten on Amazon. This has been Capturing His Kitten by Mink, read for you by Lori West and Christian Black. Welcome back. Welcome back, lady listeners. Thank you so much, Mink, for bringing us the book this week and having another new audio book. We really appreciate you hanging out with us. Um, and I'll, I'll make th- sure. Oh, oh sorry. No, no, say, I'll ahead, make sure ahead. Brother's Best Enemy is live by this time. So yes, so you can I'll go have grab the link it. in the show notes. You guys can go grab it. Yep, yeah, and make sure you're on the lookout for um, the other one that comes after that, which is the Cozy Agreement. And the one we talked about for the, um, the secret baby one, that's stalking the secret baby. Maybe that's going to be on the podcast in December. I can't wait. That one's so ridiculous. But um, up next week, we have Lucy Eden. She's got a book for us called One Scott Deal. I love it. I, I love a good pun. <laughs> but I think that's everything. All that's right. Then tell them what to do. Fuck your day up. Make today your bitch. Don't be a dick. Bye, guys. Bye. Read me romance. Read, read me romance. Read me romance. Read, read me romance. You could take a look in a book, that's fine. Or you could sit back, relax.